Grace and peace be to each of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is indeed the Christ, the Anointed One of God. And let us pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for this day and for our continued study in the prophetic writing that you gave to Amos to give to us. Lord, his first, his first recipient were the people of Israel. We pray, O oh Lord, that we would hear this message and what it has to tell us. Because your entire word is for our instruction. So Lord, show us what we need to see today. Teach us what we need to learn from this section in Amos chapter 2. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well now, last week we spent a lot more time on Amos chapters 1 and 2 through verse 5 which for us was God through Amos talking to, speaking to, giving a word of judgment to the nations surrounding Israel. Okay? He had a word of judgment for all of them. And they all started out this way, for three transgressions for Gaza, for Ammon, for Judah, for whomever. For three transgressions, and for four, I will not turn back my punishment. Basically, that particular formula was not saying that they'd only sin three times. Lord, that'd be a record. But, but that God has a measure of sin that uh, he looks for, in a particular people, and once they hit that measure, when they go just one more over that, it's time for judgment. Our God is very, very patient. And yet his patience only goes so far. He will not let us get away with sin after sin after sin after sin after sin. He doesn't work that way. Sin has got to have an answer for it. Um, I mean, he sent his son on the cross because of sin. So for three transgressions of Gaza, Tyre, Ammon, Judah, Moab, Edom, and for four, I will not turn back its punishment. Well, Amos is actually a prophet to Israel. And so, I'm sure, I'm hoping, that as the people in Israel were hearing these words go to all these particular countries around Israel, oh, they may have been going, good for them, they deserve it. <laughs> but that isn't the point. The point is, is when you're starting to see what's happening to other nations, we really need to look inward and go, ooh, do we do that? Hmm. Judah's sin that got her over the top was she failed to keep the commands of God. Judah and Israel, at one time it was just Israel, but then they split up. Judah and Israel were God's covenant people. They had been given the law of God. And they'd also said, everything that the Lord has said we will do. Right. That didn't last long. So God was judging Judah because of that. But now... The word of the Lord through Amos, his prophet, turns his attention to Israel. The shoe is going to drop now on Israel. The word is going to come to Israel. 
Thus says the Lord for three transgressions of Israel and for four. I will not turn away its punishment because they sell the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of sandals. Well, let me just keep going. They pant after the dust of the earth which is on the head of the poor and pervert the way of the humble. A man and his father go into the same girl to defile my holy name. They lie down by every altar on clothes taken in pledge and drink the wine of the condemned in the house of their God. At least five out of the six other nations that God was bringing judgment against, there was only one thing that took them over the top. God has a laundry list here for Israel. The first thing he says is because they sell the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of sandals. What is happening here? There are some commentators who say, well, you know, this has to do with injustice. And so when the righteous or when the poor go before the judge, the judge will take a bribe. You know, from those that can afford it, he'll take silver so that he will then... um, vote in favor or rule in favor of the person bringing suit against the righteous. For the poor, okay, he'll go ahead and say, okay, for a pair of sandals, I'm going to rule in favor of this person who's bringing a problem, a case against the poor. That's not what this is about. Listen to these words. This is Amos chapter 8. And this gives us the information we need to understand what's happening in chapter 2. Hear this, this is Amos 8, 4 to 6. Hear this, you who swallow up the needy and make the poor of the land fail, saying, when will the new moon be passed that we may sell grain and the Sabbath that we may trade wheat? making the ephah small and the shekel large, falsifying the scales by deceit, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, even sell the bad wheat. What's happening here? God says, for three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not turn away its punishment because they sell the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of sandals. Basically, This word right now is to those people who are actually buying and selling people. God's word, God had said that, you know, if an Israelite, if an Israelite gets into dire monetary straits, he could, he could sell himself to someone his creditor, uh, you know, for the time so that his debt could be paid off. In time, the practice became that if somebody got into debt, the creditor would come along and say, you're going to be sold to pay the debt. The person was no longer volunteering. Now it was, yes, now it was, enforced slavery. If a person voluntarily had done it, in the year of release, in the year of jubilee, they could be set free to go back to their home and to continue business. Remember, every Israelite had been given property. But not everybody profits by that. Some people have more uh, skill at making money in businesses and, you know, things like that. And some people do not. But those that are able to do more and are able to succeed, sometimes they take advantage of those who cannot and do not have the wherewithal. Right now, the word of the Lord is coming to these people who have the, the, the skill and the ability to make money, but... They're taking advantage of those that do not to the point where they're buying and selling these people. The righteous haven't done anything wrong. The poor haven't done anything wrong. They just got into financial straits. 
apparently the greed was so bad among those who were doing this that verse 7 is what it's about. They pant after the dust of the earth which is on the head of the poor. They're so greedy, they don't even want the poor to have the dust that the poor put on their head when they're in mourning because they're poor. You know, they throw dust on their head, not just to mourn, like, say, for the loss of a loved one, but because they're destitute poverty. They would throw dust on their head. Well, the wealthy would say, man, we want that too. That's covetousness. That too is also something that the Lord forbids in one of his commandments. So they pant after, they long even for that dust. They they pervert the way of the humble. Those who are humble, they're like trying to get to move to the way they do things. I don't want the humble to be humble. You know why? Because the humble are an example to them that they're not humble. (laughs) And then you get to the next one that says, a man and his father go into the same girl. Think prostitute there. They're both using the same prostitute. Excuse me? These are God's people who are acting this way. Remember, Israel was was established to be, well, they were established to be the salt and the light in their time. They were supposed to be the example so that when the nations around them looked at them and saw how they lived, the nations would say, how wonderful is this God that is so near to them. But in looking at the way Israel was acting, and then of course in the way Judah was acting later on, it became a byword. You know, these people... They weren't even, they were acting worse than the Gentiles. That's saying a lot. A man and his father go into the same girl to defile my holy name. What do our sins do? They defile the name of the Lord. That's what they do. They defile the name of the Lord. Verse 8 says, they lie down by every altar on clothes taken in pledge. What does that mean? Well, the law allowed that a poor person, if he owed somebody money, he could give his outer cloak as security for the debt. Okay? I mean, the whole idea was to pay the debt, but he could use his cloak, his outer clothing, as security so that he could then come pay the debt and then give, get his cloak back. But the law also said that at night, by sundown, that cloak had to be returned to that poor person because it was his only covering. Now this word is saying that these people, they are not only not giving back these cloaks that were given in pledge, they themselves are using them to lie down on. What's the poor doing? Going without. God is not pleased. And this next part said, and they drink the wine of the condemned in the house of their God. What in the world are they talking about? They drink the wine of the condemned. The word condemned there is a Hebrew word which can also be translated fines. In other words, Money taken in fines, or, you know, was then used to purchase wine, and then, which was bad enough as it is, so money was taken, and these were generally fines that were over and above what the people should have been paying, okay? Uh, the word here not only finds, I believe the, uh, the word that it could have been translated as is the word milked. 
not milked, bulked. <laughs> it basically means the same thing. It's the DP. They were milking the people. You know, going and above, uh, taxing them beyond the, what they needed to be taxed, fining them beyond what they needed to be fined, and basically what they would do then is then they would take wine that they purchased with these fines and go into the house of God and drink the, that wine there. In other words, what they were doing is they were doing all this bad stuff and then going into the house of God and saying, I'm in church, isn't that good? Somehow thinking that just because they go to church that's going to justify their actions. There are probably a lot of Christians who think that way too. But God in these particular verses here is not pleased with their, with their, what they do. And if you want to put a heading under it, just, you know, you go, well, who exactly is God directing this message to? I mean, it says judgment on Israel. Israel, Israel, Israel. Basically, it's the wickedness in Israel. So it doesn't matter if it's really the, the wealthy who are taking advantage of the poor or anything like that. It's anybody who does these things. So God is saying, these are the things, these transgressions that have taken you over the top. And then he says, yet it was I who destroyed the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars, and he was as strong as the oaks, yet I destroyed his fruit above and his roots beneath. In other words, he wasn't coming back. He was saying, I did this for you. Also, it was I who brought you from the land of Egypt and led you 40 years through the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. God did it. God did That's why we sang, Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die, because I wanted everybody, okay, what has God done for us? Because he's sitting here, this is what I have done for you, O Israel. We've got to say, what has he done for us? So people of God in 2017, we've got to be reminded of this. So God destroyed the, uh, the Amorite. God brought them out of Egypt. And then he says, I raised up some of your sons as prophets. And some of your young men as Nazarites, is it not so, O oh, you children of Israel, says the Lord? And the answer is, of course, yes, yes. He did destroy the Amorites. He did bring them out of Israel. He did lead them around the wilderness for 40 years. He did give them prophets. He did, uh, you know, make some of the people, some of your young men, as, raise them up as Nazarites. He did all of this. And you're doing this to me? is what he's saying. I mean, he's appalled at what is going on. In fact, so wicked are these people with what they are trying to do. Verse 12 says, but you gave the Nazarites wine to drink. What does that mean except that they just did not want the Nazarites to be that example in their midst because you see if, the, if they're in their midst and they're acting like good Nazarites and they're being the example that they are. They're not drinking wine. They're not cutting hair. They're, they're sticking out. They're example. It's making everybody else look bad. And since everybody else just wants to be bad, they want to bring the Nazarites down to the same level that they're at. So they're telling the Nazarites who part of the vow was not to drink wine. They're telling them, come on, have some wine. Be like one of us. Break your vow to God. That's what they were saying. But you gave the Nazarites wine to drink and commanded the prophets saying, do not prophesy. What are the prophets for? To tell the people the word of the Lord. Now, you know, a lot of times when we were going through the prophets here, you know, you sit there and you go, doesn't God ever have any good news? <laughs> yes, he does. But when there is correction needed, he's going to give the word of correction. Because people need to hear it. But now, what are they saying to the prophets? Don't prophesy. They did not want to hear the word of the Lord. They did not want to hear the correction. God puts the prophets in their midst to bring the word of correction. They're like, oh, we don't want to have any part of it. So these people are just under contempt 
for God, utter contempt for those that he has put in their their midst, utter contempt for what God had done for them. Then verse 13 said, I am weighed down by you as a cart full of sheaves is weighed down. Interesting as you read the commentators, some of them just cannot believe that this is what this verse says. They're like going, there's no way God can can, uh, feel weighed down by these people. Yes, he can. In the book of Isaiah, God says, I am weary of your sins. If God can be weary of our sins, he most certainly can feel weighed down by these people and what they're doing. Behold, I am weighed down by you as a cart full of sheaves is weighed down. And I can imagine those little carts with their sheaves and the wheels bowing out underneath the weight. I can imagine that. I can imagine that this weight is coming upon God and he just doesn't want to bear it anymore. So this is what God says. Here's the shoe dropping. Therefore, you know when you see the word therefore, it's everything that came before it. Therefore. Therefore, flight shall perish from the swift. They're not going to be able to run. The strong shall not strengthen his power, nor shall the mighty deliver himself. You know, everybody thinks, oh, we can do this on our own. God's going to say, no, you can't. I've done this for you. You can't do it for yourself. I did it for you. And so, since you think so highly of yourself, you're going to find out just exactly how weak you are. Flight shall perish from the swift, the strong shall not strengthen his power, nor shall the mighty deliver himself. It ain't going to happen, people. You're going to be in such a straits that you're going to find yourself just weak as a kitten. He says, he shall not stand who handles the bow. I'm not even going to be able to stand up. The swift of foot shall not escape, nor shall he who rides the horse deliver himself. This is what's going to happen to you, Israel. The most courageous men of might shall flee naked in that day, says the Lord. Amos You know, his words are from 752 to 738. This all came to pass for Israel in 721. Not long, you know, after it was uttered. Um, You know, know, I look at this and go, what do we take away from this? I wonder, I know that we love the Lord so very, very much. Yet, I also think that there are times where we just, just take him for granted. And that taking him for granted leads us to be kind of a little slack in the way that we live or the, or the things that we do or the things that we say, say. Sometimes we forget all that the Lord has done for us. Now, God is very good. He will give you a laundry list of all the things that he has done. And I would say, besides what Jesus did for us on the cross, it is always a very good exercise to look at our lives, you know, kind of look backward and go, what has God done for me? It's a very good exercise to do that and say, how how has God taken me through all the trials and tribulations of life? God is at work all the time. Sometimes we just don't do that, though. I had the opportunity to do that back in 1995. I was in Chicago at the time, and I had been a part of a contemporary Christian singing group in Houston and they were going to have their 10th anniversary, so they were going to bring everybody back together who'd ever been a part of the group and, you know, have this one great big concert or something like that. And, um, and I knew that I couldn't come, but I thought I'd write them a letter. Because those people 
had walked with me through so, so very much. They were with me during the time that I was unemployed or underemployed for three and a half years. They, they were just special people to me. And, and so I wrote them all that I had traveled and how they had traveled with me, and I just kind of did a review. And when I looked back at my list, I was like going, wow, God, look at what you've done for me. This is what God does when his people are forgetting him. He goes back and he reviews, this is what I've done for you. So that they will take the hint, you know, be corrected and say, oh, we're sorry, Lord. We need to amend our ways. Obviously, this word had come to pass in 721. And what the Lord said came to pass, it happened. And Israel was no more. Judah was still there. But eventually, the Lord is going to bring a word, you know, well, he's already brought a word against Judah, but eventually he will bring an end to Judah, at least for 70 years. You know, we know that um, as I was saying earlier that, you know, particularly in the church here in the United States or where have you, there's a lot of trouble going on. The church needs to repent. But you know what? At this particular moment, it would take a tremendous shaking by God for these people to repent. And that's unfortunate. You know, for three transgressions of the church in America, and for four, I will not turn away its punishment. Wonder what, I mean, the apostasy, the turning away from the faith. That's what Paul said was going to happen. 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians. The Lord Jesus can't come until the great apostasy happens. Now, the heathen are not involved in the great apostasy. Those who are the only people that can be an apostate are those that have been part of a faith to begin with. Because apostate means the leaving of the faith. Since the heathen and, the, and, the, and you know, non-Christians aren't part of the faith, they can't be apostates. They can be sinners, but not apostates. People in the church, however, certainly can be apostate. And Paul said it's going to be great. It is great. When you've got so many mainstream denominations, mainline denominations, telling the people that... It's okay to worship other gods. No, it's not. What's the second commandment? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And what part of that don't they understand? Are we weighing God down ourselves by our sins, church? I'm talking to the church as a whole. Because this message is going out on YouTube. It's like, people, we get, got to get up and repent about this sort of thing. God does not bear sin forever. He's already put it on his son. And for these people who are turning away from Jesus Christ, there is no other Savior and there is not going to be another crucifixion slash resurrection again. He's the only one. What are people thinking? But that's what the Lord is saying to Israel in this particular passage. I don't know, he's got to be saying something to us today. The world needs us to be the salt and the light that we are. So I pray that we will be. Amen.